and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Peter Lavelle. As the leaders of the Group of Eight meet in France, more and more question the usefulness of this elite club of countries. Is it just a talking shop? Can it really influence the global agenda like it once did? And should the G8 be abandoned in favor of G20? Crosstalk the Group of Eight, I'm joined by Andrew Hilton in London. He is director and joint founder of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. In Istanbul, we cross to Paul Heinbecker. He is a former advisor to Canadian prime ministers on foreign policy and now a distinguished fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation. And in Toronto, we have Jeff Rubin. He is a former chief economist for a North American investment bank, journalist, and author. All right, folks, gentlemen, this is Crosstalk, and you can jump in any time you want, and I very much encourage it. I'd like to go to Andrew first in London. Um, just looking at some of the, uh, uh, the pictures that are coming out of uh, the G8 uh, um, uh, festival, as I think you could call it in France. It looks very, very impressive, but is it just really just a talking shop? Do they ever really decide anything? And in the year 2011, is the G8 powerful enough to drive the global agenda? A lot of questions. It's I'm really a day at the seaside, or a couple of days at the seaside. I think it, you know, if it is only a talking shop, talking shops are quite important. It's important that these guys should get together and talk informally amongst themselves. After all, that's how this group actually originated in the first place 20 years ago. Uh, so I don't think that's, irre that's irrelevant itself. It has a value, but certainly the G8 has been squeezed. On the one hand, the important countries in the world these days are the United States and China, which is the G2, or the G20, or perhaps even the G30, to bring in some of the really important developing countries. So the G8 is more symbolic than anything else. Uh, Paul, do you agree with that? Is it more symbolic than anything else in, in, uh, in Istanbul? Because if it's just symbolic, then why waste all the money, okay? Because I work in media, everybody has to go to the G8, and another story happens in the world, and we get squeezed because we don't have the resources to cover real important stories. Go ahead. Well, the media is part of the problem, of uh. course. Uh, you, have, you have built up the G8 into some kind of enormous event, uh, and it's full of photo ops. I'm not saying that politicians aren't also complicit in that. But it had got to the point where it couldn't deliver on what it was promising because it was promising too much. Uh, that was one of the problems. And the other problem is the world had changed. And, of course, you have uh, China and India and Brazil and Indonesia, Turkey, Korea. Uh, these countries now matter a lot. and the G eight just doesn't didn't have them at at the table so uh... the, the g eight really has two reasons for being now uh... i think or perhaps three one is uh... to it gives the european leaders and the canadian leader but especially the european leaders uh... privileged access to u.s. to the u.s. president for a day and a half that they wouldn't otherwise have uh... they don't get that as much at the g20 uh, it also uh, is an organization where you can still rally the Western, sort of Western willingness to, to do things, to, to, uh, to stump up the money for places like Libya or Egypt. Uh, and the last thing is uh, it's a place where these guys can get together and talk to their peers in a, in a more relaxed manner than they can at the G20. There's more at stake in the G20. Uh, and uh, and uh, so the the G8 is less of a, is 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 less of a challenge for them. It's interesting, Jeff. If I can go to you in Toronto, how do you come out on this? Just a talking shop, and if it is a talking shop, well, as, as 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 Andrew pointed out, an important uh, talking shop. It may be a talking shop, but I think for anything more than that, it's increasingly dysfunctional and irrelevant. I think organizations like the G8 or the G20 probably had their zenith of influence after the last recession, mm. where, of course, we saw massive coordinated fiscal policy. But none of those governments have the financial wherewithal to ever do that again. And moreover, many of those governments, like Europe, China, and the U.S., are moving in very disparate and contradictory ways. So I don't think that we're going to see anything substantive out of it. But I think, as your line of questioning indicates, expectations of these kind of events have fallen dramatically in the last couple of years. Andrew, if I can go to you, I mean, in researching this program, it's, it's, it's often called a rich man's club that does not keep its promises. Do you think that's a fair assessment? 
Well, I think that's true on both counts, yes. I think it's very interesting just how low expectations are for this particular meeting. One would have thought that given the problems that the European economies mm -hmm. face, given the problems, the economic problems which the global economy faces, economics would have played a bigger part. But instead, it's very much focused on on political issues, supporting the Arab Spring, uh, the, the Japanese are, are talking about you know, making a pitch for a trade agreement, I agree, but the focus is primarily political, leaving the bigger economic issues, I think, to bilateral negotiations between the United States and, and Germany representing the European Union on the one hand, and uh, the G20 with a much, much broader agenda later in the year. I, I just think that I cannot remember yeah. a G7 or G8 meeting with expectations this low. What you, uh, so well, one, of the, one of the issues is, if I may in. interject, uh, it, it's on purpose. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing this on purpose. They have they've said uh, that the G20 is their preferred uh, uh, institution uh, for coordinating international economic uh, policies. And they have tried, therefore, to, to limit the G8 uh, to, to political security kinds of issues. So that's why you find them talking about mm -hmm. that. I do agree, though, that uh, I mean, uh, the first person who thought the G8 may, may, uh, may not be necessary anymore was Sarkozy himself, the host for this meeting, uh, who was expressing <laughs> doubts last summer whether, uh, you know, what it, the value was. But uh, it, and on the other hand, the French have added so many things to the agenda, from uh, from uh, the internet to the Arab Spring to climate change, uh, commodities, and so on, that uh, they're ending up uh, with a, a, a very large uh, uh, sort of uh, a very large number of dishes on the table, none of which are going to be properly cooked, probably. Jeff, you know, it's interesting. I mean, uh, from what we've heard already in this discussion here, um, it's, it's really agenda light. It has to be agenda light because no one is going to make any really big decisions, especially financial, economic, without speaking to the Chinese first because they count, and they count a lot now. Well, it may be agenda light, but the economy is certainly not agenda light. I think whether you're talking about China or Europe or the U.S., uh, the recovery is facing probably its greatest sets of challenges that it has at this point. I mean, we're already seeing oil prices at $115 a barrel. We're already seeing food prices above last cycle's peak. We're seeing inflationary fallout from that and rising interest rates. So there's no, set, there's no lack of issues to talk about as far as the economy's agenda is concerned, even though if that's not going to make the agenda of this week's meetings. Jeff, thank you for being a very entry. If I can give you that. I think it's, it's, I think it's very interesting sure. is that, you know, that uh, the, the G8 is meeting to solve the, the world's problems, and we'll talk about that if that's just out of self-interest. But it doesn't, and it, 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 it's been brought up here, they're not dealing with their own real problems, and when we look at getting out of this, this deep recession, not all these members are on the same page, and not by any stretch of the imagination. I think that means that there's going to be some very important discussions taking place in the margins, which aren't going really to be reflected in the uh, formal agenda or in the communique afterwards. I would imagine that, that look, there's going to be tremendous discussion uh, amongst the Europeans and between the Europeans and the Americans on the, the, state, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. There are going to be discussions on the, on the managing director of the IMF. That probably will be settled over the next couple of days effectively. These are important issues which are not really appearing on the agenda, but they'll certainly be dominating the margins of the meetings, and that probably is where journalists and other people will look for the most important outcome of the meeting. I doubt very much if they're really going to commit large sums of money to support the Arab countries of the Middle East and North Africa. I'd like to think that they would, but I think there are quite serious differences of opinion there, and trying to, to commit billions of dollars to support Tunisia or wherever it is, I think is probably a step too far at this stage. Paul, if I can go to you, and I'm not going to ask anyone here to be a Middle East right. expert here, but I think it's quite interesting this pitch of aid for a Tunisia and Egypt. And you know, a lot of people that are critical of Western involvement in, in North Africa would say, you know, you know, the money might come, but there's going to be all these strings attached, and it's going to be the West involving itself mm -hmm. in this very complicated and long-term transformation. I mean, is is that it, it's it's it shows that, is the West trying to flex its muscles, saying we're going to stay engaged in this region, and they may think it's for good reasons, but a lot of people in the region don't see it that way. Well, I, I, uh, there's a degree of cynicism in what you're saying there, and I, I don't think that I, I share it. Uh, 
uh, what we're seeing in the Arab world, especially in Tunisia and, and Egypt, is a, is a nascent uh, movement towards something that's a lot more in our interest and a lot more in their interest, and more particularly, and that is a more progressive and a more democratically governed uh, society. We can't, uh, we just don't have the smarts to be able to direct that kind of thing. Uh, but we do have the capacity to, f to assist it and to, and to back them up as they, as they go ahead. Uh, it may be that we're in financial difficulties, but we're not going to be in financial difficulties forever. Uh, and uh, this is an opportunity that is not going to soon come again, I think. So the idea that uh, somehow the West should keep its nose out of, out of that, you know, it reminds me a little bit about uh, you know, uh, when we went into Libya in the first place, and a lot of people were saying, well, the Arabs don't want you there. The Arabs who didn't want us there were the, were the, the, the now uh, bankrupt leaders of the Arab world, the autocrats uh, uh, who were running the place. The people in the street, the closer you got to the fighting, the closer you got to the bullets flying, the more they wanted help. So I think that we should be a little bit careful about uh, deprecating uh, what the West can do and indeed what the Chinese and the Indians could do. My only problem with this is, is that the G8 is a kind of an event. Uh, and it can rally support and it can produce some uh, some resources but it isn't enough uh, it isn't going to be you know it's going to be much more useful if you could get a chinese and indian and uh, and others to agree to this kind of process to get involved in it uh, and and because what we're talking about in egypt and in and in tunisia is going to be economic growth and that's going to take investment and that investment some of it uh, has to come from uh, places like india and china rather than from the west Okay, gentlemen, at this point, we're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the world's most elitist club. Stay with our team. Shoppers come to Moscow with dashboards digitized, radar upgraded and automated, guided by gyroscopes, propelled by powerful new engines. Russian rotors ready to roll. The technology update. We've got the future covered. More than a month in one of the most extreme environments on the planet. This is Antarctica, and people have to be aware that they are far away from civilization. Sean Thomas discovers what makes Antarctica so special and attractive for many. The wildlife in Antarctica is both unique and fragile. Expedition to the bottom of the Earth on RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing the relative value of G8. Okay, Jeff, in Toronto, before we went to the break, you said you wanted to jump in, so just go right ahead. Right. Well, let's not also forget what has driven our involvement in the region, and that is that when you produce 30 percent of world oil supply, you tend to catch a lot of attention from the largest world oil consumers. And I think some of the skepticism around what's happening in Libya is, 
Why are we intervening in Libya, a country that produces 1.6 million barrels a day, and not intervening in other places like Yemen and Bahrain that doesn't have that kind of oil supply? And I guess, you know, one thing we've got to remember is where we have intervened in the Middle East, and I say the West, ostensibly to increase energy supply, typically what's happened is that we've ended up getting less energy supply. Anytime there's been regime change, and it doesn't really matter what the ideology of the regime change is, whether it's the replacement of the Shah by the Iranian Revolution, whether it's deposing Saddam Hussein, the net result has been that that country has produced less oil and even more significantly exported less oil. And of course, we're, we're inviting a similar kind of, uh, a similar kind of uh, result here in Libya, where we've already lost about 1.3 million barrels a day of production. And given how tight the world oil supply is, it doesn't seem like anybody, including Saudi Arabia, can make up that shortfall. Well, it's interesting. It'll certainly keep uh, prices very high. Andrew, if I can go to you, I mean, again, going back to the, the G8 here, I mean, it's, it's interesting the kind of uh, the, the, what they want to project to caring. You know, we want to help these people. We want to, if it's going to be AIDS, it's going to be uh, food um, uh, security. It's all, all the other securities here. But if you look at it, it's still very much out of self-interest, out of the self-interest of the member countries, if they can agree on those issues. So, I mean, it's, it, we don't have to look for, you know, the, the, this kind of, um, uh, soft and, and furry West, you know, helping the rest of the world. They're, they're making money off of it. They're making very uh, uh, cold calculations about themselves. I, I think that's right. When it comes to the Middle East, I, I disagree quite strongly with what I think Paul said, was saying that uh, we went into Libya and, and we were cheered in the streets. We went into Libya and we were cheered by about 30 percent of the population in the streets. About 30 percent is indifferent and 30 percent supports Gaddafi. We've learned quite a lot of, that this is a tribal society and I think Obama was absolutely right to be skeptical about the British and French pressure to intervene. We are slowly learning when it comes to North Africa and the Middle East that intervention is very dangerous, very difficult, words are cheap, but uh, it's very difficult to see how intervention, military intervention in particular, produces a happy outcome. I do think, however, that one thing will come out of the G8 summit, and that is that the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, will be given a mandate to expand its lending into the North African region. I think there's a sort of consensus on that. It'll give the EBRD something to do. It's, it's expensively paid <laughs> bureaucrats in London will finally have a job. Uh, and I think that's not a bad thing. Okay. Well, what do you think about that, Paul? I well, think that's an interesting comment. Well, I, I think it's good that the EBRD is, is getting involved. Uh, uh, maybe it's for the reasons Andrew says, but I think it's also good for it. You know, it is a positive outcome. We're, we're looking for positive outcomes, and, and what we seem to be talking about all the time is negativism and, and cynicism. Uh, you know, uh, the idea of intervening, uh, obviously, uh, the, the intervening in the overthrow of, of Mossadegh, uh, the uh, Iranian president, and a uh, uh, democratically elected president in 1953, brought us 20 years of stability, and it's brought us uh, the, the mullahs running Iran ever since. Uh, and, and that's not a good thing. Overthrowing Saddam Hussein was obviously not a good thing in, in, in a lot of different ways, including the, the supply of oil. But this is a different kind of intervention, if I may say so. Uh, you know, Gaddafi's guys were in the, on the, uh, on the, in the suburbs of, uh, of Benghazi. He was talking about rivers of blood. He was talking about going door to door and showing no mercy. So, you know, that isn't, uh, and if you, if you look at it from a Canadian perspective, you know, obviously the, the quantity of oil makes a difference on the price, but we're also selling oil, so that isn't such a big problem for us. But it's costing us a substantial amount of money to participate in the military activity, and we're not doing it for our, our particular economic interests. We're doing it specifically because there were a lot of people who were about to be slaughtered if they weren't, if there wasn't going to, if there wasn't an intervention. All right, gentlemen, I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back to G8. Okay, I still can't understand what humanitarian bombing really means. But if I could go to Jeff, okay, let's switch gears, guys. Humanitarian Why do... bombing. Humanitarian bombing means stopping Gaddafi's people from killing people. That's all right, all right. Well, okay, we're not doing a program on on Libya. We're doing it on G8. So if I can go to 
okay. Jeff. Okay. Um, uh, why, do, why don't we just scrap the G8 and just go G20? Because that's where you have the other major players there. And that's when you can start making global policy that it, it could be a win-win for everybody because G8 is all about the West and uh, two peripheral countries on it from the West, Russia and Japan, okay? And why can't, it, why can't it the format be G20 where you can actually get things done? I know it's a bigger number, but maybe more efficient for global problems. Well, it's a better proxy of the global economy because the, the locomotives of global economic growth are no longer the United States or Western Europe right. or Japan. They're, they're China and India. However, I don't think by adding another zero that you're going to get any more mm. harmony or accord. I think, in fact, when you look at China and the United States, this is increasingly looking like a zero-sum world. It certainly is when it comes to resource consumption. And I'm not sure that you're going to be able to get any basic agreement on, on fundamental economic direction. And I guess the biggest issue at, at the G20 or the G20 G8 is, is how much longer is the People's Bank of China going to be willing to finance an over trillion uh, dollar budget deficit? Because if they step away from the right. Treasury auction, we just won't be talking about a sovereign debt crisis in terms of the so-called pigs. But we'll be talking about certainly uh, a whole new issue of risk in the U.S. Treasury market. And that's probably going to remain the one fundamental issue is how long, much longer does, does communism's last stand <laughs> want to finance capitalism's fallen angel? Because that's really what's happening right now with the People's Bank of China funding this huge U.S. deficit. What do you think about that, Andrew? I mean, it's interesting. It's, I, you know, we can go two different options, G2, you know, just the two main countries and get rid of everyone else, or go G20. Mm -hmm. But uh, G8, this isn't sustainable. It's just it's turning into just a club, uh, and a, a club that really is just a photo op. Well, I think, I think that's true, and that's the point I was making at the beginning. I think it is important in some sense to, as it were, sort of feel the... Uh, the feel the, the heft of somebody's handshake, but that's about all that the G8 is good for. Uh, but you don't actually have to go to a G2. You have to pick up the telephone. I mean, the, in some sense, the idea that you have these big, grand international summits is primitive. Uh, there is perfectly good, as we're demonstrating today, video links. People can handle bilateral issues bilaterally without putting them into a multilateral forum and without really involving the press and creating all these expectations that the world will change as a result. Uh, that you can have bilateral, bilateral discussions between Beijing and Washington without involving anybody else, without creating panic in the markets, and one hopes that those discussions are actually going on. As for the G20, yes, the G20 is a, uh, it's, it's a good shopping, ex shopping opportunity for the spouse houses of the leaders of the countries involved, whether it actually very much gets done precisely because there are 20 people there, who, in fact more than that because there are all sorts of international institutions involved, 26 or 27, all of whom need, feel the need to grandstand. So very little comes out of those meetings as well. Again, really they're an opportunity for photos and for handshakes and not much, oh, and as I say, for shopping expeditions and not much else. I, I I disagree Go rather ahead, Paul, uh, jump directly in. Go ahead. Prof Go prof ahead. profoundly with that. Uh, G2 would not work for the same reasons that the G8 doesn't work, and that is that not enough of the major economies would be around the table. Uh, <laughs> if you don't have the Indians there, if you don't have the Europeans there, you're leaving out a very large amount of, inter of the sort of international commerce. So I think that the reason that they went up rather than down was because they thought it would work. The second thing is to bear in mind is that the G20 shouldn't be seen, as you guys are now presenting it in, in the media, as something like a G8 heavy. Uh, G20 is really a process. A lot of these things have set and train activities that are going to take a long time to, de to develop. You're not going to get a result at every, every communique is not going to be, you know, sui generis, a success in itself. These things take time, and they take a lot of time. Uh, and uh, finally, the idea that leaders don't need to get together. If leaders don't know each other, and this is my, my own experience at least, they, they, they don't learn to trust each other very much. They don't learn to, take, to understand what each other's issues are. Uh, 
uh, and they begin, and, and it's very easy to demonize people you don't know. But when you have them in the room and you're talking to them, uh, you can't help but listen. And at a certain stage, you can either decide that they don't know anything and they really are crazy, or actually that they have a point. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's the way the international system works. It actually works more by face-to-face -face contact than it does by, uh, you know, social media. Uh, Jeff in Toronto. I we're, think there's one thing that you oh, said. Andrew, there. go ahead, jump in, go ahead, and can, then we'll go to, can we'll I go just to say, Jeff. There's one thing, yeah, there's one thing that you said there which I do agree with, and that is that the G20 is a process. I mean, there are no doubt there are several initiatives which are taking place under the G20 umbrella which are important and that will produce results over time. But, but if the G20 didn't exist, those same initiatives would have been carried out under, let's say, the Financial Stability Board, IOSCO, the Basel process. There are lots and lots of other fora within which international initiatives which are complex and technical can take place, not just the G20. All right, Jeff, in Toronto, I'm going to give you the last word. Should there be a G8 meeting next year? No. <laughs> I'm not sure whether there should or not, but I don't think that, that any, anybody in the G8 economies are going to be looking for next year's G8 meeting to come up with a solution to their problems. I think that countries are going to increasingly look within themselves to find their own solutions, and that giant, global, overarching organizations are probably really a remnant of a global economy that's probably ready. All righty, speed. gentlemen, we've all run out of time. Many thanks to my guests today in London, Toronto, and in Istanbul. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here on RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules. really decide anything and in the year 2011 is the G8 powerful enough to drive the global agenda a lot of questions it's I'm really a day at the seaside or a couple of days at the seaside I think it you know if it is only a talking shop talking shops are quite important it's important that these guys should get together and talk informally amongst themselves after all that's how this group actually originated in the first place 20 years ago uh, so I don't think that's irrelevant that's irrelevant itself it has a value but certainly the G8 has been squeezed on the one hand the important countries in the world these days are the United States and China which is the G2 or the G20 or perhaps even the G30 to bring in some of the really important developing countries. So the G8 is more symbolic than anything else. Uh, Paul, do you agree with that? Is it more symbolic than anything else in, in, uh, in Istanbul? Because if it's just symbolic, then why waste all the money, okay? Because I work in media, everybody has to go to the G8 and another story happens in the world and we get squeezed because we don't have the resources to cover real important stories. Go ahead. Well, the media is part of the problem, of uh. course. Uh, you, have, you have built up the G8 into some kind of enormous event, uh, and it's full of photo ops. I'm not saying that politics... In Istanbul, we crossed to Paul Heinbecker. He is a former advisor to Canadian prime ministers on foreign policy and now a distinguished fellow at the Centre for International Governance Innovation. And in Toronto, we have Jeff Rubin. He is a former chief economist for a North American investment bank, journalist and author. All right, folks, gentlemen, this is Crosstalk, and you can jump in any time you want, and I very much encourage it. I'd like to go to Andrew first in London. Um, just looking at some of the, uh, uh, the pictures that are coming out of uh, the G8... Uh, um, uh, festival, as I think you could call it in France. It looks very, very impressive, but is it just really just a talking shop? Do they ever really... Hello and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Peter Lavelle. As the leaders of the Group of Eight meet in France, more and more question the usefulness of this elite club of countries. Is it just a talking shop? Can it really influence the global agenda like it once did? And should the G8 be abandoned in favor of G20? To crosstalk the group of eight, I'm joined by Andrew Hilton in London. He is director and joint founder of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. Politicians aren't also complicit in that, but it had got to the point where it couldn't deliver on what it was promising because it was promising too much. Uh, that was one of the problems, and the other problem is the world had changed. And, of course, you have uh, China and India and Brazil and Indonesia, Turkey, Korea.
uh, these countries now matter a lot, and the G8 just doesn't, didn't have them at, at the table. So uh, the, the G8 really has two reasons for being now, uh, I think, or perhaps three. One is uh, to, it gives the European leaders and the Canadian leader, but especially the European leaders, uh, privileged access to, US, to the